One of the properties you can adjust for the bubble system is the name of the bubble.json file. This isn't really something necessary to do, but might be something you like to do if you find another name to be more fitting. Doing this isn't as straightforward as it might seem though, as you can't simply change the file name by renaming it after it's been created. If you try this, you'll find that Rempy can't seem to find the bubble file anymore, which results in the placement of the bubbles in the game are lost. Instead, you'll need to use a configuration variable called bubble.db underscore file name that should be set to the name you want for the file. This needs to be done before the file has been generated. To do this, we need an init Python block, as this variable needs to be set before the game loads at initialization time. For this example, I chose to call the file characterbubbles.json, and remember to supply the .json after your file name, as it's supposed to be a JSON file. For this test, I'll go ahead and remove the old file that I went by generated again with the new name. Now if we run the game again and place at least the first bubble for the first dialog, and then quit the game, we'll see in our project files that the file generated is now called characterbubbles.json. In the beginning of the tutorial, we saw how to create a bubble with the bubble editor by dragging over grid cells in an invisible grid. If you want more precision in how the bubbles should be placed and sized, you can change the grid size to something different. This can be done with the bubble.rows and bubble.calls variables. And as the name suggests, these two changes the number of rows and columns in the grid. These variables you can set with the define statement or inside of the init python block. Per default, according to the documentation, they are set to 24 rows and 24 columns. For this example, I'll try setting them to 50 rows and 50 columns instead and see how it looks like in the game. Now when I launch the editor and press on the first option, we can see the cells of the grid is much smaller and thus also gives us more fine control over the size of the bubble. You can play around with these values to get different cell sizes to make it easier for you to size and place your bubbles the way you want them. Another configuration variable is called bubble.defaultArea, which you can tweak to make the default placement of a bubble do something different. This might be handy to use for some games where maybe you only have one character who speaks and want their speech bubbles to be placed in the same location every time and not have to use the bubble editor at all. To use this, you want to supply the variable with a tuple containing the x, y, width and height values you want the default bubble to use. Bear in mind that these values will be based on the grid you have and not actual pixel coordinates. So if you say for example that the x value should be 5 and the y value also 5, then the bubble will be placed in row and column 5. The width and height works the same way, so if I say 10 for the width and 8 for the height, it will span across 10 cells on the width and 8 cells on the height. If we test this in the game with a bubble that hasn't been placed yet, we can see that it's placed over here now instead of over at the top right corner. Other than being able to place and size bubbles, you can also adjust things like colors for the who and what text, padding of the bubble, and other properties the same way you do with dialog for character objects. For that, we have a variable called bubble.properties that is per default set to a dictionary containing key and value pairs for each type of bubble. And the different types of bubbles are based on where the tails are located. To change the looks of a bubble with a bottom left tail, for example, you can change it by accessing it in a dictionary and adjust its properties. To do that, you would write inside of an init Python block bubble.properties and then two square brackets and inside two quotation marks, you would add bottom left. Then to adjust, for example, the who color, you would write another two brackets and then who color. Then you would simply say is equal to and then the new color you want. And for this example, I'll set it to green. Now, if we run the game, we will see that any bubble having its tail in the bottom left corner will have a green color for the character's name. If you're unsure of what other properties you can change, you can always refer to the documentation about character objects. To change the images used for bubbles, you can, like normal, swap them for your own in the GUI folder. The default bubble with the tail in Rempy has its tail in the bottom left corner, so when you make your own version, it's good if you keep it the same so the orientation is correct when you're using the bubble editor. But instead of using one and the same image for all the bubbles, you can also use different ones for different types of bubbles. So if you want a bubble with the tail in the bottom right corner to look different than the other ones, you can do that too. For that, you will want to update the bubble properties dictionary to change the window background property of the bubble you want to change. In this example, we want all bubbles in the game that has a tail in the bottom right to use the pink bubble, and for the ones with the tail in the bottom left, we'll use the blue bubble. In this case, we need to make sure the bubble images have the tails in the correct corners for this to be correct. 
Here we want to create new frame display balls for each of the bubble types that contains the images we want to use. Now since the bubbles I've created for this tutorial uses the same shape as the default one but just in different colors and with different orientations in terms of the tails, we can go ahead and use the same border values as the default one. And the border values just helps the frame to resize without stretching and losing its quality. If you're unsure of how to work with frame display balls like this and what borders are and how they work, I suggest to read the documentation about it which I've linked to in the description box below. Now when we run the game, we can see that all dialog that uses a bubble with its tail in the bottom right has a pink color, and the ones with the tail in the bottom left has a blue color. The last property we'll have a look at is called bubble.expandArea. With this, you can change the size of a bubble by expanding it beyond its normal size. This is a dictionary variable that contains all the different bubble types and how much each of them should expand in each direction. As we can see in the documentation, the bottom left and bottom right bubbles expands an extra 22 pixels at the bottom by default, whereas the top left and top right bubbles expands 22 pixels at the top. For this example, I'll set the bottom left bubble type to have an extra 50 pixels at the top as well. For that, I'll grab the bottom left key from the dictionary and then say it should be equal to a new tuple with the values 0, 50, 0 and 22. And the orders of these values are specified in the documentation as well, in case you forget. So now when we run the game and progress until we see the bubble with the bottom left tail, we can see that it now has expanded a bit at the top as it's taller than it was before. If you have a game using an older version of Rampai that doesn't already have support for bubbles by default, you can add it yourself. To do this, you can visit the official documentation page, which I have linked to in the description box below, and scroll down until you see the heading adding bubble support to a game. Then you simply want to follow the instructions. And that's all for this tutorial about speech bubbles in Rampai. For patrons in the supporter or higher, I have an additional tutorial which shows you how you can apply effects to bubbles using transforms that triggers when a bubble dialog is shown. So you can make bubbles that fade in, zooms, and other things you can do with transforms. So if you're interested in that, the link to the post for the tutorial is in the description box below. I hope this tutorial has been interesting and educational, and if it has, then I would appreciate if you press the like button to let me know, and to also help the YouTube algorithm to recommend this video to others who might be interested in it as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.